and welcome to Ashford's Unlocking AI podcast series, focusing on the power to disrupt, how AI will change business and the law. If you're interested in finding out more, visit our AI Spotlight Hub on our website, ashfords.co.uk, for more AI insights. The Hub brings together commentary from our Ashfords experts, our clients, and our contacts across a wide range of areas, looking at how AI might impact business and the law as its use evolves. Today's uh, podcast on the use of AI and other technologies in the construction design process is part of a, a wider Ashford series of podcasts about uh, the use of AI across industries called The Power to Disrupt, How AI Will Change Business and the Law. My name is Stephen Homer and I'm a partner in the construction and infrastructure team at Ashford's and Head of Adjudication and Arbitration Services. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleagues Brett Lamb, a senior associate in our commercial team specialising in intellectual property and with particular expertise in the technology sector and by Andrew Roberts, a trainee solicitor in our construction team who has a particular interest in AI and related technologies. Join us as we explore how virtual reality, generative AI, language models and text-to-image generators are impacting the design process. Hopefully, we'll also address topics like intellectual property considerations, data privacy, and security risks that designers must navigate. And Andrew, if I could start off with you, um, what are our industry contacts telling us about how they are using AI and related technologies in the design process? We visited one of our clients last week, um, a small architecture firm, um, and asked them this question. And they came back to us with three platforms, really, or three techniques that they're using um, to encapsulate AI and the technologies within. The first one was uh, virtual reality. That really featured heavily on their books. So for those who don't know, virtual reality is obviously technology that uses computer-generated environments to create a simulated reality. And we had great fun exploring this. And we put a headset on and uh, explored... Uh, VR headset. VR headset, yeah. yeah. You explored a, a simulated reality, didn't you? I did. It was fantastic. I was walking uh, up and down steps, and you have to try not to stumble across open spaces uh, on Plymouth Sound. Uh, and I even uh, was tempted to jump into the sea and swim, uh, but realised that I'd be swimming across the architect's uh, office carpet and uh, didn't really want a photograph of that getting back to Ashford's. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, yeah, it was really fun, but also informative um, how they're describing how they come up with these virtual environments. They have a variety of methods for doing this. It's either 3D scanning or something called photogrammy. Photogrammy is kind of taking lots of photos of a particular environment and then overlaying these 2D images to get this 3D virtual reality. The other way of doing it is having a tripod that has, you know, this um, 3D scanner that sends out different lasers and photo images around its environment to get all of these thousands or sometimes even millions of data points. And then you can upload that into a, you know, an architect software and it pulls together this 3D environment, which is what we were exploring in our headsets last week. And it's something that's really gripping the industry by the sounds of it. I read a, an article that included a survey by CG Architect that said uh, 65% of virtual reality usage within the UK is within the construction industry, in particular with architects firms. So it's something that's really gripping uh, architects in the design process. And yeah, like I said, was was really fun. Uh, one thing that came across to me, though, Andrew, from the, from the trip was that AI is in, in its early stages of use in the design process, at least in sort of uh, general practice architects, small commercial architects firms. And that they're using other technologies like VR much more than AI at the moment. And that AI is, at the moment, is being used, but more as a time cutting tool, something that speeds up the process. Is, was that your impression as well? That's exactly right. Yeah, they, they did mention using ChatGPT. So again, AI that's involved in cutting time. So for those who don't know, obviously ChatGPT taking the world by storm at the moment. It's a language model that's trained on a large amount of text from the internet. And when you input a text, say a prompt it's called, the model has learned through this training to guess the next word in the sentence by covering millions and millions and millions of uh, data inputs and will provide an answer on the basis of such. So the use of ChatGPT within the architects firm that we visited last week, they were using it for content generation for their website. So things like generating uh, project 
designs or project descriptions, blog articles or press releases. And they found it really helpful for cutting time in kind of the creative aspect and the creative bottleneck involved in in such things like that. So they said, you know, an, an example of a prompt that they might give would be generate a project description for a residential building design. The project is located in X city. It's intended for, you know, this use of a single family home. It should have the, this number of bedrooms and this square footage and so on and so on. And ChatGPT returned with this project description that, that the architects would run with and save them so much time. And like I said, Stephen, you know, really optimized the efficiency in generating this content. Yeah, I think the, the one thing they did say was that the prompts have to be quite tailored and specific. If you're not specific enough in the way that you word the prompt, then the output you, you get might be less useful or less relevant to, to, to what you're trying to get to. So that was quite interesting that it does seem that word skills are going to remain important, <laughs> which is good, good news to a lawyer. I mean, I, I've also spoken with a developer who said they're using ChatGPT and with a consultant who said they're using ChatGPT to write bids and, and the like. So it's definitely being used out there, that's for sure. Uh, Andrew, can I just ask you then, uh, anecdotally, what else is, is going on in the industry from a bit of research you've done? Yeah, so I've been looking around, Yeah, like you said, some of the larger firms, just to see the potential for AI and what's being used uh, currently at the, in, in the industry at large. Something that's really gripping the industry, according to you know a variety of, of sources, is AI text to image generators. So these will be things such as DALI, Mid Journey, and Stable Diffusion. If you're listening at home, um, I would definitely encourage giving these a go. I gave Mid Journey a go over the past few weeks and months, and it's really fascinating. It's well, I'll just describe what it does. It's this uh, artificial intelligence that analyzes your inputs. Say I've asked for it might be uh, generate an image of a you know, modern, sustainable residential building, the artificial intelligence will deconstruct every word in that prompt, search the internet for images that are related and basically fit the uh, description that you've given and will provide an image that is the closest to your description in your preferred art style uh, before you know merging them all together and producing really quite good content. And then once it's produced an image for you, you can then provide a, a follow-up prompt that says, you know, I don't quite like this aspect of it. Can you change this? And again, without you having to touch anything in Photoshop or even, you know, getting a paintbrush, it will change the whole thing for you just from the prompt that you've given it. So it's really interesting. So some of these are free. Some of these uh, require a membership. But yeah, I would definitely encourage you to, to try out at home. Got a follow-up question for Brett, actually. I mean, are there likely to be intellectual property issues with such uh, images that are generated by AI. Yeah, that, that's right. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a really relevant point. And there was a, something I read in the, the press very recently in the US where a, an artist, or that is to say the, the, the human in front of the laptop putting in the prompts into mid-journey did not own the, the IP in the created artwork. It was a sort of a Renaissance style artwork from mid-journey. Very impressive looking. But yes, that, that that's sort of a, a little indication as to, to what the thinking is certainly on the other side of the Atlantic. Just to come back to, to, to your earlier point as well, Stephen, around you know, acting as, as, as prompts and the sort of human interfaces between what we want the AI to come up with and what, what we actually feed into it. It's going to be a crucial skill for, for certainly for architects and, and, and all designers. It's really kind of, that's going to become a, a very critical skill in itself, I think, um, in terms of just being able to translate in a way that the AI can uh, manufacture to a specification, being able to really hone in on, on exactly what you want out of it. That's going to be a key skill. There's plenty to think about from a legal perspective um, for architects and, and, and designers generally using these tools. At the moment, from, a, from, a, from an English law perspective, we would be looking at as a designer to protect their IP rights, particularly around copyrights and design rights in terms of the, the work that they're producing in, in the course of their, their profession. Generally speaking, with copyrights, it's got a low barrier to entry, if you like. You know, simply by creating the design or the artwork, you have copyright in that, that creation. What we can see from the, the legislation is from 1988, so it's a, it's a little bit uh, of its time, shall we say, and, and certainly sort of not, not really anticipating AI as, as we see it today. But it seemed from a wording of the legislation that it's unlikely that the AI would be the owner of the the copyright because it needs to be a, a legal entity and as such we, we don't think an AI would, would fit that. Likewise with, with, with the definition of, of designs, registered designs would have, have, have one aspect and unregistered designs are dealt with, with the same piece of legislation under the 1988 Act. They are going to be difficult in terms of making clear that the AI is owning the IP 
in those roles. Grass. But if a company has created the AI, and uh, would it would that company then have rights in any images that are created by the AI? which would mean that the architect or whoever it is would, would need to exercise caution in the use of such images. I think it, it would be, be sensible because I think what's going to be important from a designer's point of view is not so much the, the output of the AI that's created, it's more whether their work is being used to train the AI itself and whether their, their, their material, like Andrew mentioned before, you know, with ChatGBT, that, that's based upon millions upon millions of, of web pages and, and uh, written work analyzing what the next word is likely to be and that's similar with with an, Im an image generator the practical problem for a lot of designers is going to be we don't really know how these models are trained as such um, because there's so much r d and so much investment by the companies in creating their, their ai they don't want to sort of show what the what the secret is what the magic is and that's going on inside the box which makes it very difficult to regulate and very difficult to prove that actually your work has been used without your consent without your approval to create new, uh, ostensibly new uh, images from the AI. So I think it's an area where designers are certainly at risk. Um, I think if you are a business looking to create your own AI from scratch, it's going to be quite tricky in the sense that because it requires so much financial resource in terms of being able to build it itself, you're really going to have to be very careful in terms of the quality and type and, and amount of material that you're using to train the AI you're going to have to make sure that you have the rights to use the material, uh, the intellectual property rights. And that's, you know, that, that's a sort of a global issue, if you like, because actually you might have rights in one country, but th those rights might be different if in a different jurisdiction, a different territory. I think at the moment, because we have the technology rapidly uh, exceeds the speed of the law, so the, the, the law is kind of constantly playing catch up, if you like, we really could do with a more overarching global framework to try to regulate the use the use of it but at the moment you know, that there are there are steps being taken we've got the ai summit being held uh, being held in the uk i think it's in next next month where we're going to get get some of the major territories from the eu the us the uk um, china will be, be involved as well and trying to get some degree of consensus but that's a very difficult task in itself um, getting that, that consensus to how we regulate it how we govern it so at the moment it's a question of really sort of operating with, with quite a degree of caution because you've, you've almost got two ends of the spectrum in terms of how the AI is regulated. You've got the open source model, which is it's very transparent and everyone knows what goes in and, and to a degree you, you have more insight into what comes out. But that, that that's harder to regulate because it's a bit, a bit more of a, a Wild West approach. You can also have a very highly regulated approach uh, where it's a little bit more uh, restricted in terms of access. That would tend to concentrate the power into the into the hands of a sort of a fairly small number of large tech businesses, which can help to try to restrict or prevent rogue actors to a degree, and should in theory make it a little bit easier to police for a government or, 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 or uh, a law, law enforcement agency. But I think you know one thing we can we can say is that you know over the past few years it's proven hard to hold some of the bigger tech companies to account from a legal point of view just because of their, their sheer size and yes, the, yeah. the, the clout they wield. So we're we're at, we're at an interesting juncture, shall we say? Yes, yeah. And can I can I ask you, Brett? Are there any other particular intellectual property issues that designers need to think about, or have you just covered it? Do you, would you say? I would say that I would say that copyright and design rights will be will be the, the, the key things for them to think about in terms of the issues to protect. There, there are moral rights as well, which, which sort of tend to attach themselves to some of those rights we, we mentioned earlier. Particularly for for an, an architect, they have sort of particular rights around the the right to be identified as the uh, the author of, of a building, and that, that would usually be take take the form of a, a plaque or a sort of signage near the entrance um, around that. But I think to, to a large degree, it's, it's, a, it's a question, it's sim similar to lawyers in some sense, in that we're, we're, we're in a similar boat in that we're, we're both uh, professional services providers and we're having to learn to coexist with, with AI and how it's going to upend our industry a little bit and likewise with designers. So Absolutely. having to learn to coexist with, with, with it rather than put, put the genie back in the bottle, we need to sort of see what we can do to, to make it work for us really and, and try to coexist rather than, rather than overcome one. Okay, that's, that's, that's really interesting. And, and Andrew, what about data privacy and security? Yeah, well, this is another issue with some of the technologies that we described today. So, for example, with the online language models, every input that you're putting in, you are training that online model to, you know, to develop its intelligence, if you like. So 
that information that you're inputting into that language model, you can't guarantee that that will be safe and won't be subject to data breaches and so on. So after speaking to you know our clients last week, they said that if they do use these you know, chat GBT, for example, then they would anonymize any uh, sensitive client data. And if they're using it to review a large piece of text that they've received from a client, they would try and generalize it as much as possible so that it's not relatable to their client at the stage that they input it into this language model. And that seems to be how they're going about yet skirting any risk to data privacy and security. Well, just to uh, conclude, um, I want to thank everyone for, for listening. Um, and just as a point of interest, the introduction that we started with was uh, partially written by chat gpt so we can't claim um, to be the author of everything we said it just shows the you know that the uh, in- ever increasing use of ai which is ongoing at the moment and is likely to transform the world we live in thank you for listening if you found today's uh, podcast of interest then please do check out our ai spotlight hub on ashford's website www.ashfords.co.uk